Hello, hello. Hello. So, hello everyone to the next episode. I don't even know which episode this is, so we never count. I so count. It's number seven. What? Really? I count. It's number seven. <laughs> About from, from, from the rebrand, right? Starting from uh, the rebrand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And total? I don't know. 20 or something like that? Probably. Good. We want to talk about Tailwind today. Um, and because Tailwind is quite a topic which polarizes our audience, ourselves maybe as well a little bit. And let's say it's, it's, um, it's a controversial topic. So it's different. It's a different approach to a old problem. So I would count it, uh, I'll phrase it like this, but this, this stream today is to, to figure a little bit out, um, is if, if it's a, it's a good way to go or not, and when to go this, this route or not. And okay. uh, I think, um, we already have written a lot. We have several posts, several discussions. I saw several discussions coming up right after my posts on other posts as well about this. Maybe this is, uh, or coincidence, but I think, you know, when, when some of those topics come up, other, others, you know, others, others spread as well. So we will, we will discuss today. I hope we have most of the people here today who, who discussed together with me, this topic already on, uh, on LinkedIn, that would be an mm -hmm. interesting part. And we will have some live coding as well. So, um, Dennis today is making his first experience with Taywin. <laughs> And uh, we will do a side by side thing. Um, so comparing um, a little component we built doing with SCSS or CSS and Tailwind and taking a look how it works just for a first brief introduction to give everyone an overview of what we're talking about. Um, have I forgot anything, Dennis? I mean, we can start with explaining what, what the heck is Tailwind. Because I have, you know, I'm I'm mostly working with teams who use either React or Next, but I never really code hands-on with anything that touches CSS. So I, my expertise generally stops at the at the JavaScript architecture. I was never really passionate or, <laughs> let's say, competent about styling anything. I don't know why. Um, so I was never really the target audience for anything Tailwind related. So maybe you can tell us like what's maybe you can tell us who telling what what hard problem does table tailwind solve? Let's start there. So what, does it what solve problem a problem or is it just a, is, does it just have good developer experience? So what what many people write is um, it solves the mess you create when you're going with a normal or let's say vanilla CSS approach. Okay. So of course, mess is is relative. So why is there a mess? So oftentimes there are other dysfunctions in your teams that you actually create a mess. Um, but let's say, especially long term, um, it is there is some truth to it that um, regular CSS is a very low level thing regarding the open web stack. So there is no real, let's say you have some specifications okay. and that's it. So you can use it th this way, that way. There are like, like BEM, like, like, like um, several ways you can, um, let's say, group your classes. You can, you know, extend those classes. You can use styles. You can chain specific classes. Mm -hmm. You can use frameworks for this. And this is this is basically the approach. To, so you have it's it's very loose. So when you when you go into the, the the web world, front end world, it is very loose when it comes to styling. So um, and when when I join teams or my own teams, then or do it myself, then I realize, especially in the older projects. So I've you know used CSS for I don't know something between fifteen to twenty years, years of active duty. And so, so vanilla J, uh, mm -hmm. CSS, and it was like that. So it it felt every project felt a little different. So and what you do um, to to mitigate those problems over time, um, I saw that often as well, and I saw that in in the comments quite often in the last days is mm -hmm. that people try to create some form of um, reusable classes for things instead of you know having a very unique class for every component they do. 
you know this is um this is then the approach and uh, this is already the way to which uh, you know which tailwind was gone so tailwind tailwind is not the only thing out there who's which is doing that um mm -hmm. the the overall idea is atomic css you know where you have the 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 idea of utility classes uh, having reusable things and um, there is there's a lot to say about this so it's it's very hard to explain that in several sentences which is the reason why we have an entire stream today about that okay. and um, there are other problems as well uh, we we need to go through them you know i've written down a blog post about that maybe we're going through that one that would help to structure a little bit and um, you know going through everything pros and cons and there are cons of course as well so we need to talk about those that's that's very important um as well so tailwind just just throughout for, for you know before the session now it is not the go-to solution so it's not in not in show for ad, for advertising tailwind so we are not, we aren't sponsored so we don't know adam Wetham, and i don't i know that many people don't like him <laughs> many people love him because um, together with um stroger uh, he, he he they they created not only tailwind they created the idea of um uh how was it called refactoring ui that book mm -hmm. i never bought it to be honest but i'm still interested into that and um, the the overall idea of what tailwind and tailwind ui the overall idea of the design system behind tailwind is quite interesting it is about simplifying things so there is a term it's in a blog post as well it is the upper ceiling of complexity which means that um when, when we when we talk about a loose CSS world where you can do everything you want. Lewis S CSS is very powerful. So you can literally create artworks with that. So you can put time into one page, you can put weeks into one page and optimize it and make it even fancier, more animated, so many things you can do on this single page. But what you can do else is creating a wiki-like page, which is very simple. Or take a look at Tailwind UI, they're doing that there. It is a very clean setup. And okay. this is this is what many people refer to uh, upper level of complexity. This first of all the idea what you know how complex can a single element in the DOM actually can be you know, can, can become, and this is a difference between the default CSS approach and Tailwind because when you use Tailwind, you try to to um, simplify it down because otherwise you get into some kind of let's say max length hell in your ID, you will see that. So this is a big problem that we have those screenshots where you have this wall. So I, I quickly can share it, wait a second. Mm -hmm. um, I just start presenting. While you do that, Kaloyan has a good comment. So Tailwind versus regular CSS looks like the composition versus inheritance approaches in object-oriented programming, right? Should we reuse the components of the composition approach or reuse what you inherit from the cascading of the star sheets? Great question. Great question. I need to reread. Sorry, Tailwind or regular CSS looks like position. Yeah. Right. So should the should the style sheets be global and then rely on the cascading nature of style sheets, or should everything be essentially you know having like a little module and then you should assume that every module has like a reset, mm -hmm. like a full style sheet reset from a. I'm assuming some kind of document fragment or something with an ID or a certain tag is always reset for a certain. This, this is this pattern CSS of BEM um, of this this modeling. Um, and what does BEM for? stand for? I'm I'm not familiar. I, I with forgot. BEM. I need to need to take a look again. To be honest, I, I'm not using that one. I just what was what it? is that? Block element modifier. Block, right, exactly. And okay. um, um, the idea about that is Next that thing. you uh, that you start to um, group in modules so you have a module and you mm -hmm. can put this module for example you have um let's say a molecule type of component which has some atomic components below that and then you basically have a class above that and then you can basically module down so you know um, cascade down and make sure that those class this module is only set for this type of component okay. this is a little bit how styled components think as well so you you try to to bind styles closer to a component and less global mm -hmm. so if you don't have any system it is very global especially when we take a look mm -hmm. at legacy projects i very often see that um you have this 
global files implemented uh, so imported everywhere and those you know st start to overwrite things and um, this this is actually the css hell everyone should avoid so you should have some form of system but what kaloyan um, was was really pointing well is that that we need to take a look at what what do we want to do and especially yeah. when we talk about component driven frameworks or libraries let's mm -hmm. stick with the example of react because we will have live stuff in react today and we had last session react and we will have next week react mm -hmm. with pwa as well um so you are in components so um there is a distance between mm -hmm. your components so let's say the html markup and your styles and this is often referred as uh let's say um, this a mental distance and physical distance so the physical distance is how far in the code is the actual um, applic applicable style distance away from the actual markup from the okay. actual element so how okay. far it is away is it one file away is it several cascades away is it in the mm -hmm. same file but different location or is it on basically right on the markup element which can be okay. for example the styles we know all we all know them you can write css styles directly into the styles attribute that would be basically zero distance this is basically at on spot then you can have it like styled components uh, where you have for example a definition in the same file just above the component many do mm -hmm. like that or in another file then you have it's a little bit like connaissance so there's a there's a there's a distance in there and you have a mm -hmm. mental distance the mental distance is what causes us power to to get you know the connection to to see markup and understand how this markup is actually styled because it's another file so mm -hmm. you may have it open into you know split browser thing then it's it's not that much of a distance um if you, you can you know say okay it's not really the, the, the different file it could be the same file but the point is it, it's still not at the same spot so you need mm -hmm. to understand and process the cascading of css and your markup at the same time for yeah. example if you traverse like uh, you have greater than uh, you, you want to have the diff element you know below whatever element and this is something you need to process and this is the mental distance the further and more complicated this is the more power it it consumes us or forces us to put into um, this project if you have multiple files multiple elements it get even worse and with Tailwind, the interesting part is that this is very low. So you always have this, you have other type of complexity, but these distances are very low, very, very small, actually, sometimes even zero, especially in smaller components. Um, and when you are used to that type of atomic CSS, utility CSS stuff, you directly see what's going on. So this is maybe something uh, which is related to Kaloyan's question, where we really talk about um, do we how how do we structure that the, in, in tailwind is especially made for you for being used in component driven so very close very low distance uh, very small distances to the actual elements you know okay so, um max so, also had a question just before we continue mm -hmm. max mentions hello max it's good to see you again it's been a while um also, before we continue with the questions, if you have any questions about Tailwind, like what mm -hmm. would you really like to know? What would you like us to explore? We will have some code on the screen. I'm the test rabbit today because I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my hands dirty with a little bit of React shenanigans in Next uh, and Tailwind. Um, what are you interested in? What, what about Tailwind annoys you? What about Tailwind really helps you? Are you using it? Are you not using it? Like what's, what did you hear about Tailwind that would deter you from using it, or what convinced you to use it? Like anything that might be interesting, top of mind for you, let us know in chat, and we'll address it live um, in the next, you know, hour and a half that, that you're with us. And thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm. um, so Max mentions when it comes to CSS in modern front-end development, is a better practice to keep CSS codes Tailwind as close to where they're being used. Yeah. A global approach is used for global teams or variables, but the component styles should be isolated from other components to minimize the concerns. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I even heard sometimes that people, uh, when, when custom elements or web components came out, um, they mentioned that um, it, it's actually a good idea to use then um, DOM isolation in order to, to isolate CSS from each other I mean, as well. Yeah. I'm, 
I have a stupid opinion about this, you know, which is why I'm a little, being a little bit more silenced today because this is mostly your topic because I'm not I'm not that enthusiastic about CSS in general. Because um, I have a very irrelevant, you know, because it's just me solving small problems, you know, not hard problems, but just small problems that I, I end up in with front end as a solopreneur or as a coach is I just put all my CSS in JavaScript. I know, but that's just how I am. Because honestly, my... In, in, in which form of JavaScript? I don't care. As long as JavaScript compiles my CSS, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know that Tailwind is to some degree being used for that purpose, but it still produces CSS. I just, if I'm, if I'm building React components, I find a plugin, I find a framework, I find something. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know. I write maybe 10 components every year. And every time I write a React component, the ecosystem changes so much. That I'm just using a new plugin or a new framework anyway. Um, and <laughs> One I framework just per component. Yeah, yeah I'm just, and I just prefer having my CSS in, in my JavaScript, not even close mm -hmm. to, in my JavaScript. Because we got to think back, you know, I, I got into the industry, you know, learning CGI and handcrafting HTML and CSS. And, and not even having a CSS file, but writing styles in HTML with the style pack, which is a completely passe argument in 2023, right? And I remember back then, the main pain was loading them in the right order. Loading them in the mm -hmm. right order, so the cascading and the priorities are in the right order, having uh, element uh, selector specificity to the, to the right target so that they, they override correctly so that you can do something without having to use important or that you can some, sometimes use inline overrides or ideally never have to use inline overrides. And when we got components, right? So we started building JavaScript apps, not documents, because yeah. we, we got to think about this. What is HTML for? HTML is for a document. Mm -hmm. It's for a letter or A4 document that has text scrolling left to right or right to left, and you read it vertically in a single column. That's what HTML is for. And CSS is meant to style that. Yeah. The biggest mistake, I think, in the CSS standard was I was adding ID selectors. That was, to me, the craziest bit. Like, like, like how early ID selectors came in and how late and element selectors came in. I think that's whatever that CSS two, CSS three, right? To get you know, give me the four TF H two, you know, to target you know, or it give me the four TF H one to to target chapter forty, right? Because that's how. Because it was meant to simplify LaTeX uh, back then for document writing. Yeah, but it seems that, silly. This is me. actually the origin is um, so for CSS is not for building web apps like we know it today. The exactly. origin from CES is that we needed, as you said, HTML wasn't powerful enough to satisfy people uh, regarding styles it was on a basic it was, document. First of yeah. all, it was ugly, and every browser had a different default implementation for what their default ugly was, which yeah. is why we got CSS, so that, first of all, you had to reset the browsers, because if you didn't style it, it looked different in every browser. Mm -hmm. That was the first problem. <laughs> yeah, so first you had to yeah. reset the CSS to the same baseline. Then you had to polyfill mm -hmm. all the resets for all the features that this particular browser doesn't have. And then you added your own CSS, right? So you that, that's already CSS hell. And that CSS hell was going on for 10 years, I think. Yeah. From 2004 to yeah, 2014. But, you know, you, you had, you, and you had this, let's say, this media industry still, where we know Quark Express, InDesign, yes. uh, even, yes. even Word was very, powerful very enough to style Very print-focused HTML print focused, shops. Exactly. Yes, and there focused. we had styles, paragraph styles, inline styles and yeah. all these kind of styles you had that already in pdf documents people lost their shit about strong. Exactly. <laughs> and but you do, but you, what you don't have is uh, what you don't have is let's say uh, especially on the html side it was like you only had strong you only had italic and you can yeah. make a line break a paragraph maybe a headline and you mm -hmm. were lucky and, and as you said it, it looked um, the different so yeah. css was made for documents Today we have web apps. So documents can be 
come close to a website maybe you know mm -hmm. it's displaying something it can be like a big ad okay it's, mm -hmm. it's it's quite similar but when it comes to something like a web app a very complicated ui with a lot mm -hmm. of layers things moving animations uh, you know user feedback complicated states um, this is where css you know um is is like it, it can do that and you see the evolution towards that. So CSS, it, basically they made it capable of doing that, like Flexbox, like Grit, all these kind of mm -hmm. stuff. They weren't part of CSS2 back then. Um, I think they were, in, I'm pretty sure they were. In. So uh, you had this float left clear stuff back then, you know, to make layouts somehow. That was the idea to making websites. And today you have this like very powerful, CSS styles to basically create any form of UI you really want to have in a, in a very performant way. That's that's for okay. sure. So this is the this is the basic story of why CSS. So, but the problem with that is, let's say um, there is another evolution. So when we have back, we talked last show about jQuery a lot, and jQuery was still like you pick an element and you do something with the element. That was the idea of of jQuery. And today we have this. React pattern, this view pattern, this component driven pattern, where you create those components and then you, you, you play with those component like bricks, but you want to have them as isolated as possible. And let's say CSS was made for a global approach, a document wide approach. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those reasons. Um, I think this is how I understood it. Why things like Tailwind were actually invented because you have some form of repetitiveness when you when you use CSS styles in such a big web app environment. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a different thing when you build websites, of course, but when you build web apps, it is something of more complex things. Uh, or, yeah, a, a more complex matter. And this is where I see um, the reason or let's see the need why why something like Tailwind was implemented because people mm -hmm. just started to invent their own that they're their own atomic CSS variants. Mm -hmm. Even things mm -hmm. like Bootstrap already gone into this. I direction. grew up on Bootstrap. I, actually, I grew up on jQuery UI because that was like the first. Yeah. That was the first time that I, as a JavaScript engineer, was happy with anything <laughs> that's in that ecosystem, mm -hmm. where I basically got not just something that looks good, but also is interactive. So the animations, the easings, the UI components that came from, you know, and, and I think jQuery UI stayed alive as long as it did because it had really good drag and drop uh ui com um model yeah. dialogues um, um like m yeah, it, mouse it, wheel scrolling like it just it just had a lot of it had you everything know, you need to like it, it, it modern even UI was features and effects and animations and easings yeah. that then became sort of staple and sort of assumed man state of the art any... i would call yeah. it state of the yeah. art like 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 box uh galleries and all this kind exactly. of stuff exactly. uh, people people used it for years and they implemented yeah. people all took it too far jQuery. there was a huge explosion in the ecosystem and it, it got a bit you know i opened up a page i opened up a news <laughs> a news page and it loaded 47 javascript files and mm -hmm. there were four different versions of jquery on the page and seven different yeah. plugins of galleries and i don't know that, that that was that, that was too far we have a comment on that uh Tailwind has a kind of zero configuration i know it's not zero at all it provides a configuration to easy set up colors and stuff. This is super mm -hmm. nice from our perspective and the communications of with a graphics designer because styles changes during the project time. Uh, yeah, especially in the beginning. Um, we mm -hmm. have that often as well that we have external designers, external product yeah. teams um, where we work with WebA. Um, Kamila is not here today. So, um, I, I'm, so. <laughs> but, um, so that, but we have that I, as I'm well. Glad. So, yeah. I'm glad we got to the point where, you know, designers who are building stuff in Figma, you know, nowadays the gap is so, so small, right? So between mm -hmm. what's on their screen and HTML, right? So the gap is really small nowadays because it used to be very yeah. far away. It used to be that a designer would create something pixel perfect in Photoshop, export it, and then whoever was doing front end would then look at a picture and then in their mind, they would put together the HTML and sort of try to get it pixel perfect as it was on the screenshot, like analyze uh, colors from it, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Tony has a no. comment. Hello, Tony. Uh, using Tailwind in production for years now, 
try out style components, bootstrap and others before, but Tailwind feels incredibly natural and easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tony, That's could natural. you tell us what exactly, what about mm -hmm. Tailwind made it so natural? Adrian, what do you think? Um, the natural part comes from the distance. And you know, you have, so when we just talk about one the distance senior... as in cohesion, yeah. the CSS code or CSS generated CSS code is, 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 is far away from the, the actual component. part. Yeah. 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 And, and we humans, especially when we work with a lot of components in an environment where we might not be mm -hmm. familiar with at the moment because we lost context and stuff like this. And, um, you know, it, it just cost us mental power to process that. The more mm -hmm. it, it we need to put in, the less good we feel about that, because we know when we get to work, it will, you know, it will stress us on some point. And this is a problem with CSS. CSS by itself is already a little bit complicated. Um, it's uh, no matter if you use Tailwind. <laughs> If you use Tailwind or not Tailwind, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's really ugly and you don't know exactly why this is not rendering like you are, like, like, like you think mm -hmm. it should be rendering. And um, the easier you, you make this for people, especially, and this is now a really important point, especially for mixed teams, because it's, it's simply not real that most of the teams have only high level 20 years of experience CSS people who started with CSS one and are today in CSS three and everything is yeah. fine. So mm -hmm. you have junior developers, you have intermediate developers, you have backend developers going into front end. And mm -hmm. all those people say, as you said, you're an experienced developer, but you still are afraid of using CSS from time to time. I'm, you are not yeah, comfortable. I, I, I just don't comfortable. enjoy it. Yeah, I just, exactly. I just, I just throw a stupid question at ChatGPT and have it solve it for me if it's possible. But that, but that's that only works for greenfield, uh, for for greenfield projects. Once yeah. I'm working in a project that has that setup, it's very hard for me to sort of exactly architecturally adopt that mesh instead of the backend mesh which I'm used to, right? Because I'm and, thinking, and... okay, how does the data flow? I very rarely think about this problem of okay, how does how how do I decompose the screenshot I see in my head? into various forms of uh, layout hierarchies. I find it very difficult. I don't know why, but visually I find it very difficult to stratify, the, yeah. the layer, the cake up. Um, and and this, is, this is what many people dislike. And of course, several people like, so it's, it's polarizing. But um, mm -hmm. as, as, as we see in Tony's comment, it's uh, very easy. And it is actually, let's say, um, You've, it, it, it feels good. So for, for the Tailwind users, they like it because you see a button element and you mm -hmm. see the wrapping element around it mm -hmm. and you see exactly by just watching at those things what happens, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, of course, it, it can be a little bit ugly from, from the horizontal perspective, let's say, okay. but you get used to it. And the point is, um, especially with good prettier settings, you can basically sort those things. You will see that when mm -hmm. you're working on that today. Um, so you basically always have positioning on the left-hand side, box small things in the middle part. It's actually my uh, the, the thing I use. And then the mm -hmm. other things are, let's say, modificators, where you can say, okay, what's the hover state? It's a little bit on the right-hand side. And okay. the other thing is, as I said, maybe another point which adds to that as well is, um, when you use Tailwind, you try to avoid every class. So when you use basic CSS, you tend to, oh, I can make it even nicer and even, um, let's say, more appealing or something like that. Mm -hmm. And people in CSS tend to overdo, tend to over-engineer. This is yeah. what I see Agreed. most teams. And Agreed. especially, um, you know, you try to, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a lot you can overdo in CSS. And with Tailwind, you, so, try to, to, you try to do as less as possible because otherwise so the code a... will become ugly. You know, as a as a wait, I think we have a comment on this. Max, hello. Yes. Uh, also, today is the first time we're streaming on Twitch, and I see there's five or six bots on Twitch already, very happily following our our <laughs> channel ch channel expansion. Uh, I checked. I think it's bots, um, but it's just really interesting. <laughs> so. If you if you have any issues with LinkedIn, if you don't like the LinkedIn video editor, or if you have issues with YouTube, you can also check out uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, or you can check out Twitch, which is a much more 
personally, YouTube and Twitch are by far my mo most favorite streaming platforms. Um, so there's that. Sort of, we've listened to the audience and we're sort of making it, making your viewership experience a little bit more comfortable. Um, let us know how that works for you if you're interested in that. It is a little bit more esports and gaming oriented um, platform, but nowadays, you know, I'm I'm really I'm doing some research on a Excel esports channel because uh, <laughs> I'm into those things. <laughs> um, but that's for another session. Um, so yeah, if you're on Twitch, let us know. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, we, I, I want to test if comments work. Um, yeah. So Max mentions uh, this is the latest comment that we have that I can see. Max mentions the benefits of Tailwind that I have been experiencing since a couple of months after I started using it are one, very fast development speed. Two, better performance for better minified bundle sizes because it purges on your CSS. Mm -hmm. I saw that, which is really interesting. So, and three, collocated CSS with HTML, which is Mm -hmm. or with the GSX of the component, uh, which is very good to figure out what is what. And for highly customizable, if used in a proper design architecture choice, like Atto, atomic design. Atomic design. Atomic, like atomic yeah. design. Also, another comment. I think every component in React should have its own CSS module component, but should only style the component itself, what is not relative to other things. Yeah, so this is the hard part, right? So this is like, wh where does, you know, where does a web page have a theme that has to override something in a web component style, right? So for example, if I have, you know, dark mode is easy because that you can globally detect. But if I have a theme that I say, I have a UI library and the UI library can come in this variant or that variant, and I have a plugin and the plugin is a certain color, you know, th there's an additional color in the button, you know, you know, I don't know, YouTube red, for example, for a YouTube button. At what point does that YouTube red clash with a certain shade of white or a certain shade of black or a certain shade of gray that has mm -hmm. to come from that from that global styling and how do you make those interact like so that's the really hard problem the hard problem of cohesion and composability in css that honestly i think i think css is the problem not so much that we have this problem. I think if we CSS all stop using is not CSS, a problem. it's always the user in this case it's just a <laughs> form of language of descriptive language uh, you can you can write down you know it's um, mm -hmm. it's it's a let's say a property thing and how you let's say design that is act up completely up to you and this is the problem if it's yes. completely up to you it's completely up to an individual to a mm -hmm. team to an organization and next year everything is different because they have new flavors and legacy it code works. then then you know it works Twitter hello, Twitch. Working. hello Twitch. yeah Twitch is working nice. <laughs> and um, you know Thank it's you. it's 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 a bit little, it's it's like that. So um, when we go over my 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 article, it's it's not too much about the front end development. It's it's a lot about the team and the strategic aspects. Why we should use mm -hmm. Tailwind? Oh no, why I decided to use Tailwind in my context because in my in in, in this article is already described. Uh, this, uh, I have already described that it's not for every use case. So that there are mm -hmm. use cases where you end up bet be you know probably not using Tailwind. Um, actually, so, not, not but, many. But use we cases. had some comments. We had some yeah. comments on that already before we started the screen. So Marcel, whom you know, I believe, and yeah. Richard and Mark Van Erwen, who you also know. Um, they are, let's say, representing a more contrarian or a more balanced perspective okay. about Tailwind. And then there's the, like, the extreme haters who are like, no, heck no, no Tailwind in my project. So what is the, you, you know the communities a little bit better than I do, the front end, the Tailwind community. So what do the, what do the Tailwind haters say? Like, why would they not use Tailwind? They told that we have a Tailwind battle today. I haven't seen anything from that so far, but well, well let's take. A yeah. Look. So, who here is anti Tailwind? I, I want, like, I would really like to understand, yeah. like, your. And, and as we said, this is not an adver um, advertisement for Tailwind, just because we uh, try yeah, to, so... to 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 shed a little bit light of the positive things. It so is we want to have reasons from you not ah, to using that. Yeah? We had a we had a we had a screenshot. So, oh, from yeah. what I saw, Tailwind. So one of the I'm opening the up that that. Contrarian Tailwind article regarding atomic and utility CSS. Yep, do it, do it. 
uh, and wait, but yeah, so the only problem today is that I can share my editor, but I don't think I'm be able to share my browser because I have the studio open and everything else, and I don't think I'll be able to organize everything. Sorry. I'll take a look. Uh, so yeah, I'm sharing the article now. This is the article. And I, I think this was kind of the main idea about what, what they don't like about Tailwind is that it might produce something like this, mm -hmm. um, which I agree. And this we, seems we like need a to problem. talk about this. This is something you don't have in your IDE. First of all, you don't have those blocks in the IDEs. Those are aggregates. You see that this is now you'll not have something to, you have to you have to explain this to me. Well, what is an okay. aggregate? An aggregate of what? An aggregate of class utilities. So, for example, if you if you um, for in, in in many projects I use, I have a max length of 120 to 160 characters um, in yeah characters per line, and um, you can't do that with that. So, you, you uh, if you do that, you have this exact block by. Uh, let's say imp uh, implementing soft break. So what I do is try to avoid soft break. This seems to be inspected in the browser. So th of this course. to me looks, looks like a this, Chrome it, or Firebug. Or, or, exactly. Or this is the console. assembled version. This is the assembled yes. version. You see, in f it's it's low level. Mm -hmm. So this is not not necessarily what people write. So right. when you write Tailwind, first of all, you try to have as less. Um, styles as possible. So if, and this is what I write often about as well, is when you use Tailwind, you tend to not do artworks, which means you, you, you avoid very complex designs. If you go into very complex designs because you are a designer and you want to have a website which is just flashing everyone, then you mm. don't use Tailwind for that, first of all. Interesting. The second okay. Thing, the second thing is um, when, when, you, when you go for, let's say, complex animations, complex, let's say, complex responsive design. So let's say several um, breakpoints. Media points. queries about different breakpoints. Exactly, yeah. animations okay. and all this kind of stuff. If you want to chain this up, you do two things. First of all are the aggregates. You, you start to do your positioning styles. You start, to do your, you start to separate your animation styles. You start to separate the styles for specific things into, in React, those would be memos. And then you aggregate them again, or line them up, chain them up to what what's actually the outcome. Then you can so just this work. This is all gibberish to me. <laughs> that, that yeah, but but this is how, how you actually do that. And the second part is um, I forgot what the second part was. I forget when when I when I when I get to that, then and I, I'm coming back mm -hmm. to that then. So um, uh, and what we see in this screenshot, you have this real large block. I personally, in the last I think three and a half years using Tailwind. I'm, I'm a, <laughs> one of those early adopters. We never had something which is even the quarter of that one, even in the output. And we are happy with that. And um, I think this, this is one of those points. You should try to ask yourself, what is the upper ceiling? Ah, I, I remember what the second one was. Um, this is what I write in the white raft often about as well, is um, you can't apply to Tailwind like you would apply to CSS. So in CSS, you have a markup and the markup is, let's say, not not really made up to, to, to let's say, please the CSS. It is like you make the markup and the CSS is not to make the play together. It's meant to separate. Yeah, right? so exactly. So this is, this is an advantage in this situation. Of... So you are very free how you, you know, do things with both of those things. When you use Tailwind, since you, you try to get the distance very close together in the same spot, then you need to start. And this is what s several people like Jason Knight, for example, complains a lot about is when you get, go to Tailwind UI in the examples or in the Tailwind documentation, you see this lot of diff containers. So the markup is modified to fit Tailwind. And this is one of yeah. the cons. Yeah. Um, and I understand this, but this is not a con. Like I wouldn't use Tailwind, so let's say the advantage. It's definitely is conning me. I'm already, I'm already getting, <laughs> I'm already getting annoyed. So, so because I can, I can, I can. Now, now that you said that, I can sympathize with the contrarian crowd because I would hate that as well. Like I would, <laughs> if I had to do that, I would rather put my style. Yeah, in but now, now, if, now we if, come again to the I, point. If I didn't have to manage all those problems that Tailwind is solving manually. Which is the aggregates? Which is yeah. the media queries? Which is the um, the separation from style mm -hmm. to thematic styling on a, on a global level? Yeah, 
Um, the, the point is the point is that you need to to um, learn to use it and when when you when you use tailwind on a regular okay. basis with a team together you see that the overall amount of code is shrinking you only do what's really necessary you you um you manage that very well at the risk and of maybe there being a little bit more markup no, not, not really, not really. It's, it is, it is not like you have now, you, you, you quantify it by five times. It is, it is sometimes you quote quantify it by two. So it's not like, it's not like right. hell. So don't use, and they are really bad. Don't use the tailwind examples. They, they, they are not what we see. This is the reason why we don't use any templates. Um, and, and the part is that uh, the, 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 the thing is that, um, you will learn to use it as you learn to use CSS and any other form of language or descriptive thing out there. And the more you get to, used to it, the more clear you're getting me excited. And, and the point is, you are in uh, in, a, in a document, uh, sorry, in a re, in a component driven environment. And that's mm -hmm. very important. Um, if you only have a single component, let's say you have um, a molecule where you have a label and a button, in a descriptive text, yeah. Then this button, the button already is a, is a separate component. So you have only three mm -hmm. elements really. You have the, the wrapping element, you have the label, and the button, or maybe the text. So four elements, and those four elements, if you have this in one file, it mm -hmm. is not much to process in your head. You know, of course, you should not, um, let's say, try to seems bend like, your seems HTML. Like a lot to me. If, wait, so wait, 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 but it seems like a lot, but I think, but I think I'm missing the detail here. I think we should see it on the screen. When yeah, so, going, so like, imagine you have a card, you know, a white I, I don't card. want to imagine it. Let, yeah. Let's go through the comments and then let's actually put it on screen. Cause okay. I'm already having difficulty yeah. following. Um, I'm well, already having difficulty comments, following yeah. the markup and then you're explaining something on top of the markup they have to imagine. Uh, <laughs> to me, that's a little bit too much right now. Um, so Max has a comment. Um, which is the most annoying part of Tailwind is the ugly face of HTML or JSX, which is also preventable by choosing a good component design. What does this mean, which is preventable by choosing a good component design? What does that mean, a good component design? What makes, what's a component this is, design? This is what I'm, I was and, to start to talk and, about. It is and like, what's, um, what makes a component design good? Good yeah, for whom? Keep, keep it, keep it, keep it small. So the, the larger components become, the more ugly they become, especially in React when you have 5,000 hooks and you don't know Large exactly and you the start sense to, to that they have tightly multiple responsibilities or exactly. that they are, have multiple exactly. stylings or that they have multiple... It, it is both at the same time. And this is the problem. The, the, you have in one React component, you have hooks, for example, which are there okay. for the business logic. Um, you have, um, let's say, you have aggregates everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you have like like use memos. You have um, you have stylings, of course, everywhere pl placed in. And what you should prevent is let let them grow because you tend to couple those things. You you tend to use within one local scope things which don't belong together. And um, this is what makes it really ugly. And of course, if you have then a very big HTML tree. And the HTML tree grows vertically and horizontally because you have indentations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, this becomes ugly then as well. And uh, the reason for, for go going into smaller, let's say, components, they have that in Airbnb linting rules as well, that you mm -hmm. are only allowed to have one component per file already. Mm -hmm. um, so that you have, as I said, if you have a molecule like a card, which is the smallest piece you can have is a wrapping element. And mm -hmm. let's say the, the elements then aligned, but nothing further. So if you go into the button, which can be a more complex element with icons, spinners and stuff like that, you have that then again as a separated component or, for example, um, yeah, those things. So you mm -hmm. need to make sure when using Tailwind that the overall architecture meets those requirements as well, which makes Tailwind a little bit like a framework, even if it's not titled as a framework. It is a formal framework because it defines how you can work with that. So you are not as free as you would be with CSS. You it's have being called the CSS design. framework, so it's it's calling itself a framework. I mean, is I, I just okay. opened the website. Yeah, I so, opened the website. It's called itself a CSS framework. 
Good, then it's a framework. So I'm um, basically, I wasn't aware of that. I was thinking they were not uh, <laughs> calling the, I, I, I thought they call themselves as design system. But you, you which... used the word previously when you, when you were referring to react memoization, mm -hmm. why did you call that an aggregate? Because oftentimes you aggregate data because if you just have a primitive uh, stored, you probably don't need to do that. But if you, you have memoize primitive, yeah. If you if, so if you if you have a news memo, it is it is some form of data also if aggregated form of data, even if two okay. strings are combined, you know. And this is okay. what I call aggregated this time. Okay. In this case, I was just unfamiliar with that usage. Is that industry standard industry practice, like the way you use that phrase? Most people use just call it memo. I think. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, has a. Ishtan has a comment. Ishtan says, I think a lot of people are just using Tailwind exactly as it was inline CSS. That was my impression as well. So if a UI element has to have a rounded border, then they're adding something like border for the hundreds of view files, and then, yeah, or they might repeat several times, like border for here, border for there, border for there, border for there, in the same component, mm -hmm. in the markup rather than the local, the, local the, the, the component styling part, right? I think that mm -hmm. that's the comment here. Uh, and if the rounding has to be updated for eight pixels, then they have to replace border four with border eight in hundreds of files, which is a maintenance nightmare. I hate that too, but I'm sure there is a better way of working with Tailwind. So that, that just sounds like that's just a, a encapsulation problem, like not using aliases, not using proper, um, I don't know what the correct Tailwind term is, but you can probably merge together a set of selectors and give it an alias or give it a new name um, to package them together. Um, without having to rely on a markup hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm sure that's like a skill for Tailwind that you can learn. Like, I don't, I don't believe that it has to be inline, that every Tailwind selector has to be inline defined every time it's being used. There are two, patterns. In the there are two patterns to solve this. The first pattern is, as you just mentioned, create a class. In this class, you just maybe do CSS or use the at at uh, at apply. Um, how was it called again? I, I forgot the word. How, the I, at I, apply. Can, I can. So it's called at apply, but I, I haven't um, the, the, the type of entity, how it's called, I forgot the name for that. Directive. Directive, right? Those, those are the directives. Yeah. So um, you can you. basically, um, you can basically um, type into normal CSS files Tailwind mm -hmm. as well. And the app at apply directive is exactly for that. So you can stay with your design system. And that's the only you, reason you should use Tailwind inside CSS yeah. is that you have still because you don't think in pixels, you think in the design system of, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, rounded dash. Hopefully, two. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If you have a and, design system, and yeah. then then you then of course you can use these classes with a good format. You see, have these classes always in the beginning of the of the class chain, and then it's actually um, something you mm -hmm. can use. I used it in the past when I started because it was so familiar. Using that, that was a little bit of the hybrid approach between CSS and Tailwind, but mm -hmm. even even the Tailwind so you would creators use Tailwind don't defaults. really like this approach. You know? So you would use Tailwind's defaults as like a default design system, and then you would override with inline, uh, with inline stylings. Yeah, inline in form of classes. So it's not yes. really styles, yes. but um, yes, you do. And the other approach is what I tend to use after several years of using it is really making sure that the overall component design is covering that. So when you take a look mm -hmm. at designs, mm -hmm. it is not like you really need this idea of styles anymore. So you don't, for, we have this rounded corners in, in which web, so I, I haven't built a web app in the past where every component does have a similar rounded corner thing. It is always a little same. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. So mm -hmm. some, for example, we have that in MUI already where you have this, was it card? This, this white box, I think it was card. Um, you have this 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 white box, for example, and most many components just use it, or you have it in Ionic framework as card, well. Yeah, it's a card, and yeah. the idea is to have this component and then reuse the component, and then you have it again that you have the style uh, basically um, abstracted into a component, and you re you reuse this component instead of mm -hmm. the classes, because what you want to achieve is to separate stylings from component. So not sorry, let's say 
global stylings from components because you should reduce global stylings as much as possible because if you yeah. are control component driven you are component mm -hmm. driven you are not app driven so we should stop to think of our app as one big thing it is not anymore mm -hmm. you want to switch you want to be able to switch between projects be mm -hmm. switch between micro front ends or something like that so yeah, you don't want the... to have like one global project css and then have that carried around i mean that was the recommendation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when mm -hmm. we were relying on jQuery to have like one master CSS file and then have certain certain sections of the website that might have some special styles uh, to sort of give complement overrides. Because back then we were solving the problem of we want the CSS file to land on the user's browser as fast as possible so that it can be cached for subsequent requests. Mm -hmm. But this was for a much older infrastructure of the internet when you really had to choose between do I want CSS connections open or do I want JavaScript connections open? And back then it was preferable to have JavaScript connections open because you could only download two or three things at the same time and you really wanted those two, two or three things to be either images or JavaScript to really, really get the top of the fold experience to the user as fast as possible. I used to work in advertising back then, so it was really important. Like we measured two milliseconds when does you know when does this appear? When does that appear? In what order does it appear? If CSS is slightly late, can it be late? Is there a timing difference between synchronous or asynchronous, depending on whether it's cached or not? Is there an execution difference uh, depending on whether it's cached or not? So all of these little things come into play. Um, but nowadays with React components, one, one may say that the hardware is so good that the JavaScript is so slow that we don't care about these problems anymore. Uh, and I think that that but that's for the HTMX crowd. Uh, <laughs> Some other thing. Mateus, so, um, Mateus, yeah. Mateus, Vrobel, Vrobel. It's a problem called skill issue. Always people misuse tools, and, and then when another people will work in the trash code, they hate patterns. Now, I'm not sure whether this is a pro or contrarian take. Um, I think it's a neutral one, to be honest. So I understand it like that, and there's some truth to it. And um, mm -hmm. in the same moment, I dislike it a little bit. Um, because there is a problem out there, and this is what I read quite often. So I, Mateusz, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. It's just a sentence. But mm -hmm. um, what I read often is people um, should master their craft. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a fan of mastering craft. So I'm doing that myself. I'm mm -hmm. working all day long. I'm doing that for so many years. I'm sitting there on the weekends, in the night. And when, when, when I don't know something, I work myself into <clears> it until I know it. So, so I'm one of those persons who, who likes to, to know about things. The point is, um, and this is now what I don't say as an engineer, but as an employer, as a team lead, as a CTO, as whatever I was in the past, it's like, you don't have that as a common thing. This is what I, what I really, really, uh, let's say, worry about when people mm -hmm. say, yeah, you should master your craft, because this is not a realistic scenario. You cannot just tell a team of five when you have five teams, which is 25 developers to, to be that everyone should be a master craft on the same level with the same mm -hmm. opinions, same experience. So I have oftentimes teams uh, or mentees who assemble teams right in that moment. They don't have the people that they're actually yep. hiring in that moment, five to 10 devs at a time. So you cannot ex expect. So even everyone is just just everyone is applying as a senior developer. Yeah, but you have, and everybody has their own opinion about how the yeah, how exactly. the design system should be architected. Not even how it should look like, but how it should exactly. be architected. Now, and so I, it's, I really it's hate very it. hard to I get, really hate to get that to get a baseline. With, yeah, yeah, I really hated that working with Angular devs, uh, back with with Angular one, because we didn't have a lot of choices back then. But the the really opinionated componentization that came with Angular code, and I think with CSS modules uh, for JavaScript. It made it so difficult to work with anything, with, with not, not really with componentization, but just behavior that required CSS reactions. You know, so behavior that had like an ease in or an ease out animation, or behavior that had some kind of, um, you know, <laughs> resize this box with <laughs> JavaScript, and then inside it have relative sizings because there, there might have been some, you know, um, there, there might have been some element of this is a video, and then depending on the device, change the quality of the video. But because we're doing that with JavaScript, we don't actually know how large the video tag is 
at mm -hmm. load. So if we don't want it to flicker, we don't need to have a reasonable default for it. But if we have a de reasonable default for it, then if we got the loading wrong, or they just <laughs> might, <laughs> if they're on the media query, just slightly on the border, then the video might load three times or four times. And if they're on a mobile device, then that can create a problem. So it just creates this like whole chicken and egg issues where you might have signal dependencies mm. on how you make decisions in your design system. Is it CSS first? Is it JavaScript first? Is it a component first? Is it project first? Is it designer first or front-end developer first? And who is making is it the, the same decisions? Person? Most people are, don't, are not making those decisions as a team exactly. decision. Exactly. It's like so every just, developer they is install, doing... They just install something stupid, like some blind framework. They just pick a template and they just follow it until it stops serving them. That's what I saw most of them. But they just hit the limit of whatever framework they're using, whatever, maybe a material UI, maybe bootstrap. They just hit a limit and then they look at, OK, what plugin can I install to get a little bit past the limit? Um, uh, but that's to really wrap hard up, to, to, to wrap up the last comment, which was um, this, uh, about Max. No, it Mateusz, was Mateusz does have follow ups. So if we're going to if we're going to have a yeah, conversation yeah, but, with uh, Mateusz. Um, yeah. I think one after another is better, to be honest. It's, it's a little bit okay. more fair, but um, um, a little bit why we're talking about that is um, systems are often helping to mitigate those fluctuations in a team. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's not, and this is my, what it was my concern, what I was talking about is that you just cannot say that everyone should be able to deliver in a specific quality, in a specific style. Um, you should have a system, a framework around, which helps you to give an overall idea in, in what everyone should work and everyone can mm -hmm. then work towards this type of quality. You need to set qualities. Quality is always something you set before. It is not about, about being as good as possible because this is plain over engineering. You want to set a quality and meet the quality. And this is very important. Um, next one. Uh, we already hit that. This is just um, Max is as far as I see. Oh, as Adrian said, I just keep the components or just keep the components as small as possible for small responsibilities. That way there is no need for giant tailwind classes. And then you mm -hmm. compose them together to create a bigger, uh, bigger layouts. And this is exactly what, I've, what I was talking about, right? Um, so yes, just a, a good thing. Um, uh, Masume say, uh, saying that I think the idea behind Tailwind is great and there's no problem mm -hmm. with that. Development, tracking and fixing styles are really easy. The problem is uh, with the way we use it and uh, our design system Adrian mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah it it's seems, actually It, that, it, it yeah. seems clear to me that Tailwind is very hard to work with if you don't have some kind of design system in mind. Because otherwise you'll be yeah. copy pasting some silly silly generic design system that then has that class hell. Yeah, um, Tailwind alone is not a full design system. Tailwind is just a part of the styling and you need to still have, when you work in React, a, a comprehensive but, but no way. But no doubt, when you're looking for a, a theme or some kind of theme pack or icon pack or style pack or component style pack or component pack for React, you might be looking for Oh, does it have Tailwind styles, or does it have SCSS? You know, does it have this, or does it have? Um, so, I'm assuming you, as the, I'd say, design system architect, or the designer, or the full stack developer, or the front end designer, or the front end developer, you're already making a deliberate this deliberate choice to target. Uh, tailwind specific components. I would Cause disagree. Because will or will you write? I, would I totally disagree in that one because we cannot compare Bootstrap or MUI, for example, to Tailwind. So that's what I was scared. Yes. That's if what if I was you scattered. go for MUI icons and you don't use MUI, you will get to a form of problem. Mm -hmm. Tailwind mm -hmm. is a is an is a big alias in form of utility classes for CSS. So it's not like the, the, the Tailwind design system is more like normalized paddings. It's more like normalized. If you say you want to have text it's a, Excel, it's a generic example. it, it so is it basically like font size it. plus leading, okay. but it's okay. not more than that. 
So okay. it is not it is not handling how your icons it's more are like looking a place inside for reset, exactly. not so much right. a design system. Because if you need to go to the point where you need to fit in a icon into a button, this is what you need to build yourself. This is something you need to build yourself. This is yeah. then I'm part learning, of the I'm learning a lot today because I wasn't yeah. I wasn't you know, I was never really focused on this this level of nuance. Mm -hmm. with, um, and with this is the reason why we went away from something like MUI because it's it's a hell. It is really it's too hell. opinionated. It's too opinionated. Yeah. When, when I remember merging five apps from MUI four to five, it mm -hmm. took us two weeks just to refactoring to can that it wasn't refactoring. This was basically rebuilding um, on some point. Yeah. And I, we, we were really annoyed because the effect of this design system basically mm -hmm. affected everything. And by Tailwind, in, in those years now, we never had a single issue with that. We never needed to refactor anything in that time, anything. There was nothing mm -hmm. at all. So um, sometimes we saw we had duplicated classes or something like that. But today we, we basically have a linter who's helping us with that. And, so, and, and um, especially when we got prettier, you know, prettier mm -hmm. rules for that, that we that everyone is aligning the, or using the Tailwind classes in the same order. This helps a lot. Okay. And then you don't really have that because Tailwind is just a replication of CSS. So if CSS doesn't change and your markup doesn't change, there is no need for some to... form of migration. I, I, I This is a bit of nostalgia for me, but when you just mentioned classes in the right order, like that just hit me. Because <laughs> when I started my career, 2007, 2006, I worked with one of the best, but really one of the best, best HTML, CSS guys in this region and in, in this part of Europe. Um, and Matthias, he used to like really, really, he, I think he built like 200, 400 websites, apps in a few years. He was just, he had a, like a really rigorous and very pedantic component system that he set up in HTML. Neither like a very, very rigorous discipline about how he structures CSS, how he structures his HTML. And one of his things was that he had a very, very much a semantic order in how he puts the selectors. He would always put a selector, like a, like a, like a class plus ID plus class. He had a specific order in what order they went into the file. So he had like a linter system in his head. And then the this, the the CSS um, styles also had a very specific order in how he ordered them uh, inside, right? So he would use it from more, most significant to least significant. So the most significant was on the left, things like mm -hmm. text size, font weight, font family, that those were on the left. And then minor things were on the right side so that you, you didn't have to scroll yeah. so that you could brain parse it very quickly. And I had a linter that would always sort those alphabetically, and it would just drive him crazy <laughs> because his system was very hard to express as a linter. And I would just hit Control S and it would just be, I'd put it alphabetically. It would drive him nuts. It would it would drive him crazy. Whenever I sorted all his styles alphabetically, and he was like, "No, no, where?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there are there is good reason to do so because um, the of less course. questions the team have, and especially yeah. if you have those those systems inside your IDE, inside your let's say integrated development environment, people don't question it. If new people come inside, then they just, then they just accept those. If you don't have those and it's just a convention, someone mm -hmm. is you know trying to implement, then the next one is saying, oh, maybe I can do that better. And this is already some kind of psychological problem in, inside of teams. But let's go on with Mateusz. Problems where in the past with other utility-based CSS frameworks, semantic UI or utility classes in Bootstrap, uh, with rapid development or when devs abused it, it caused a lot of problems during refactors. Um, and I'm yes? assuming refactors of markup, right? So you were you would be changing the markup and you had to put in some markup to make the CSS framework happy. But then when you're refactoring the markup or reorganizing the markup, then you have problems of like, I'm now, I'm now, and I have coupling two ways. Like I have a markup coupling with, with the opinionated Mm -hmm. markup framework like react and i have a markup problem with the opinionated css framework which might have been semantic ui or bootstrap or something else and then i just you know then i have to decide who am i following 
am I create am I gonna make it render more slowly and make CSS yeah. happy or am I gonna make my CSS file bigger and make it render a little bit more optimally at least that's what I'm encountering the most from my current work with full stack engineers that I'm coaching is that they end up having these dilemmas like who should I make happy like I have like two masters uh, two frameworks who are telling me how to structure my markup they sort of touch in the middle uh, how should I optimize my work and, th and there isn't I can never really give them a like clear answer because it is quite complex and I, I would always prefer to give them an answer um in the in the form of well this is just fixing a symptom my my, my suggestion would always be if this keeps if this keeps happening then you should prevent this problem from happening not have a good solution to it mm -hmm. But there's has quite a few sessions. Yeah, we should go through stuff. them and maybe then go into the practical part. Um, yeah, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'm, so problems where I, in the past? Oh no, I was already there. Yeah, we already uh, did this one. Yeah, next. Lots of the applications does not go with component architecture or any other component-driven patterns, and it's very hard to use utility classes in a proper way. This is true. This is what I said in the beginning. If you just build a landing page, a single page application, you still can use Tailwind, of course, but the point, let's say, the larger your scope becomes, mm -hmm. the less the less interesting it is to use Tailwind. So all the benefits are not great anymore, up to mm -hmm. a point where they're actually looking like the Tailwind documentation, and I don't mm -hmm. like them. So I really mm -hmm. don't like, and I understand people like Jason Knight who who, who complain about that in in a in a rude way sometimes, but he's right in that moment. So seeing those things is like I, I bought Tailwind UI in the very beginning for I don't know something. In the three figures area for a lifetime thing and I, I i was so disappointed i i weren't used those things it was not possible for us to use those they were just a like they were looking good we were just rebuilding them but you it, this is no it wasn't it was not it was not like, like like we were supposed to actually implement that so this is what i can answer to that one um yeah, that's actually true. Uh, back then, yeah, CSS modules in 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 form of sp the specifications, how they are specified. But of no, course, I think I think that's when you import a yeah. CSS file in per JavaScript, component. and yeah. then Webpack will highlight it's... that either as a JavaScript tag in the browser yeah. or to but, sort of but package you... it, bundle it together. In we in we had that. Pack. So this is a, what we see today is a pattern we used in the past as well. Uh, it was just manually, so you in, in uh, you, you had just to uh, to basically you imported a file for a file. So if you had mm -hmm. a for example a button, then you yeah, imported yeah. The, the CSS for a button and a um, something something like post CSS in the past. Like what mm -hmm. was it? Those was it was it something from Google? I don't know. Those those minifier then put it everything they baked it Yui. together. In I a think file. Yahoo. It was Yahoo, I believe. I no, it wasn't from Google. Yeah, now that you said it. It was something from Google, yeah, like some this kind of compressor. For you, it, like Angular, Angular was not. Actually, it was. Angular was a component architecture, but but the components were full stack. You know, React, for example, has a very clear distinction of React creates front end components. Next JS, for example, creates full stack components. Angular one did follow that full stack philosophy in hey, the components should live on the back end, and then the back end code. In this case, the JavaScript backend code is then building or delivering some kind of uh, JavaScript bundle. But that didn't survive very long because everybody just started using it as a front end framework. And then that whole full stack component idea fell through the water. But we still had then that full whole MVC lifecycle on the front end, which made no sense. And I think that's what Next.js has become. Um, I'm in the middle currently. I think the utility classes are prone to create problems not to solve them. Uh, we are using Tailwind in a project, in a new project. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now using, sorry. So we will check how it will work. Um, many people do. And I can say mm -hmm. it wasn't harming us. So um, mm -hmm. I recommend to read my article about that. Um, it's, it's explaining actually the story a little bit as well. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, you, you, you should rethink, you should really understand Tailwind before you use it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just plan and, and, you know, experiment a little bit about that. As long as you stay in components, the largest problem you can cause is 
inside the scope of a component, so it's not that bad. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, next one. Yes, I agree the, to quality and engineering part, but there are companies that do not have senior engineers or just senior full stack developers who do not know the proper way of create front ends. Knowing OOP and writing huge Java, C sharp, and Python does not really translate all to front ends. So we as front end specialists, we can talk about core quality and architecture. It's hard because other people also could do it but they don't mm -hmm. have capacity to learn everything. And this is the reason why we use frameworks, actually. So, yeah, yeah um, many people say we should return to, to, to let's say, core web things, uh, return to this. But no, the C, sharp, the, the, the C people don't return to assembler. You know, it is like mm -hmm. we don't return to the very low level things. Um, TypeScript people don't really return to JavaScript anymore <clears throat> because on some point those 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 things were created to solve problems. So we don't return mm -hmm. to them really. So some people mm -hmm. are annoyed because of that. So they tend to return and make a big topic out of that. But in reality, the majority is not going back to the low level things because mm -hmm. the low level things give us too much opportunity to do things. And we are humans and humans mm -hmm. tend to be creative on some point where they should not be creative or doing Undo. over engineering, you know? On the architectural coachings, where I get architects, tech leads, backend, full stack developers into this kind of discussion, we usually go down uh, on large or large systems. Large backend meets large front end, or complex complex front end meets federated microservice architecture. We usually get down this rabbit hole of at some point you gotta separate out your code, your business logic from every framework you're using from the infrastructure framework, from AWS, from the backend framework, from the middleware framework, from the frontend framework, even from React. And they just go bonkers. When we touch when we touch the subject about React, everybody goes, no, but I'm not a frontend developer. I'm a React developer. Or they might say, oh, I'm not, I don't know how to design without material UI, or I don't know how to design without bootstrap, or I don't know how to design without this theme, right? So it's it quickly becomes this problem of like, who, who are we serving really? Like, is this a business problem or <laughs> did we over specialize in our hires? Like it, it becomes really, really difficult then to have these conversations of, well, I'm not telling you not to use React, but I'm telling you not to, not to carry the opinion of the framework across all layers of, of, of the, of the, of the, I'm, I'm not the build process, but let's say the architecture process. And again, I'm not advocating like some really crazy nine tier layered architecture just for your front end. But two layers would be nice. One that has framework stuff in it and one that doesn't. I would be really happy with that. Because then we can test cover the non-framework part. And then ideally the framework part has a framework specific testing library, which, you know, React testing library comes to mind. And it's not perfect, but, you know, it does solve a... a a typical problem that you can avoid then spinning up Cypress for or spinning up some kind of end-to-end -end testing tool just because you don't have that sort of buy-in from the framework. Like it is it's 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 the wrong <laughs> it's treating the symptom, it's not solving the problem, but at least you have some support, you know, from from you know the, the framework then ends up being a jug uh, a, a drug and then your <laughs> your drug dealer basically just <laughs> has your back on that on that front. But not the, I don't want to diss on the React community. I don't want to diss on the Tailwind community. I don't want to diss on even the jQuery community. These frameworks are ex extremely well-crafted. Extremely well-crafted. A lot of care and a lot of effort has gone into especially the security and the performance of all of these frameworks. And, you know, you got to give credit where credit is due. These are very, very good high quality pieces of technology that I wish we had sooner. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's actually a good point. Also, and I think it, we'll have to moderate Twitch chat at some point. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, at the moment, I'm a little bit, uh, so we have four <laughs> um, <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> we, 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 so um, is it possible um, to combine a CSS module in React with Tailwind? Um, it, probably it is. Um, so CSS is not telling you to not use, uh, sorry, Tailwind is not forbid you to use CSS. You can mm -hmm. use, let's say if you use Tailwind, you can use normal CSS as well. It's not recommended because you should not use standard classes and Tailwind classes and styles together. 
if it's mm -hmm. not really necessary because um, sure. you it's problematic with uh, which comes first and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff uh, you know it's like which is using important which is not important and which comes first it is it is it is not already recommended but for example if you would choose to you could actually do so you could just mm -hmm. imp import a css module and you use this classes as a class name so it's actually not a problem in the end it is just css tailwind is nothing special tailwind is no javascript at all it is just a, a, a basically a build processor which mm -hmm. uh, which you know just creates utility classes which will be loaded by the browser Sir, uh oh, did we lose Adrian? We might have lost Adrian. Is it me? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, so he stopped speaking at utility classes. Um, let's look at the next comment until Adrian refreshes back. I, ho I hope Adrian's back because he set up a a a practical example where I know nothing about. I just have it installed in my system and I'm. <laughs> I'm waiting for him to come back so I get some guidance on how to how to set it up. Um, let's see. The next question was again Mateusz. I think that Angular one seven introduced front end based frameworks. Um, yes, but again, Angular has been you know if you end, look at end of life dot date, you know Angular version nine was LTS in two thousand twenty, right? So Angular had a lot of versions in a very short time frame, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that a positive or a negative. But it was, it was the preferred approach to, to, to think about this idea of view models back then. You know, it, but more in the traditional sort of MVC style of building things that I don't think really took off, because the industry was heavily going against that because it ended up creating too many like glue classes, uh, and I think that's why. Frameworks such as React started dominating the market, and Adrian's back. Yeah, I had a disconnect. Everything okay? Uh, switch to Wi-Fi. I don't. Uh, I switched to uh, 5G. I don't know exactly what it was. Okay. Mm, doesn't really matter. Yeah, now. you were mentioning so. something about um, material UI and utility classes, and um, regarding CSS modules. You were answering. The I CSS okay. modules. Of course, you can use them, but you shouldn't. Um, so okay. let's say um, it is it is possible if you really find a use case for that it's possible technically. Because have it's another just question CSS. about yeah. yeah. Have another question about material tailwind. I don't know. I'm what a little bit related. Is. What, what what is material you tell? I, I need to Google that. I think it's tailwind. It's material UI built in tailwind. Material so tailwind. It is. I haven't used it yet, so I can't comment. Can't comment. It does seem a bit weird know. to have. It, it looks to be like the, the worst of both worlds, but I'm not sure if that's a good Combined? thing. Combined? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's a good thing. So um, I, I think I think Mateusz would be against Material Tailwind because it's, it's sort of highlighting the issue that Tailwind might end up in if um, you don't have a design system. This, this is a point for me as well. I was against Tailwind. I was against Bootstrap. I was against jQuery. I'm always against everything in the beginning. <laughs> And this is some kind of natural selection thing. So you need if, to use if I am convinced of something, I went through a history with that. So it convinced me on some point yeah. in, in, in a positive way. Um, so when I see this, I definitely think I won't use this. But it doesn't mean that it is not good. But um, every experience I had with Material UI was very bad especially long term so is mm -hmm. probably not what i want to use um, i don't like pre-designed frameworks because every designer comes up with his own ideas and I, we had a project last year in, in, in ionic framework it was a horrible thing um, it was like we should use ionic framework but ionic framework should be customized to a point where it mm -hmm. was just a hell to work with that it is not. It is not recommendable. If you use, I had the mentee last, last, last to, to yesterday. I had a mentee as well. He he's an engineer management planning at the at at the tech stacks. And I I told him already that if you have something like MUI, stay with MUI. If you have ninety percent overlap, you can use MUI. If you have yeah, only fifty yeah. percent overlap, stop doing yeah. that. Yeah. That's yeah. stupid. No. Yeah. No, I, I was no I was in the same camp early <laughs> okay, on with sorry. React or Angular, Angular One. I said, ah, let's let let's go Ang, 
let's go react and then i switched companies and everything was in angular and i was like okay okay i mean i i, I will i will survive <laughs> right so I, I will i can tolerate it and then i get used to it and then i was like okay no I, you know what i actually can't get used to it because <laughs> then i started thinking about oh i like the reactive patterns i like that you can hook in rxjs with ngrx especially since we have a node.js backend so we could reuse some parts of our observable types because we're then type scripting everything on the back and the front as well so i'm just like oh okay this is I can see some benefit here, but I think the benefit is from us hacking the framework in a way that is not meant to be used, but we're sort of making it work. But then I was like, oh, but I don't have to do this in React. And I was like, okay, that's uh, this is nice, but now let's not never use Angular 2. I'm just I'm just gonna stay in the React camp until some something better comes along, like Swelt or um I don't know, Astro, HTMX, I don't know. I get they are it, it, they're starting to become more and more niche and starting to look more and more like PHP. So, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you uh, gotta, you gotta take your wins where you can. Sorry, sorry, uh, I was, I was thinking all those are new about our streaming software is now showing me all the old comments. Um, so oh, I, I can, see. I can still see them. Yeah, so I can see we got some Twitch love. Uh, also, Dildi mentions. I think the coupling from React is a big problem. Building bright mental models for this is not easy, though. Yeah, I agree. Um, I can recommend uh, Pete Hurd. Pete Hurd is somebody who specializes in this. He's like a full stack engineer who specializes in front end architecture. And he will basically teach you how to create testable components by teaching you how to think. Uh, this is not endorsed, not sponsored in any way. I just, I just love his, his, his work. Um, how to build, um, how to think really, how to think in component mental models where you're putting your business co business behavior first and you're not coupling coupling all logic to the framework again it can be a little bit difficult it has this sort of hexagonal vibe to it where it might create a little bit more layers than you're comfortable with but i think that discomfort has its merits you know you should be able to navigate to say oh no like direct coupling bad but also four layers bad like we the truth is somewhere in the middle, usually. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, my take on that. Uh, did we mention Grant's comment? On the first version of my site was just a CSS and HTML. I need to do much more than I'll use going forward, and I will have going straight to a framework. And he said, I use Vue and React after, of course, to compare. Yeah, I, I use this as well. Whenever I, I hit a spot with a framework where I say, ah, OK, this is something about the framework is starting to get on my nerves. I then start uh, exploring other things, but usually, you know, it's a it's a very long term experiment. I, I'm very hesitant, in I'm very conservative in when I change front end frameworks, and I'm not a front end developer, right? But I do have a itch for React, let's say, although I'm not very good at writing it. I just, I'm I'm more I'm more of a React editor. If you ask me to write something from scratch in React, I will I will be <laughs> talking to ChatGPT a lot. Um, Mateusz mentions, I agree to using frameworks. That's why full stacks prefer CSS frameworks like Ant Design Bootstrap because you don't need to know anything. I, I agree with this take. As a backend, as a backend focused architect, I, I agree with this take. You just use components and don't care about the JS, HTML, and CSS. That one does not solve problems for them. However, in a team setting, I would prefer not making this decision and offloading this decision space to a framework. I would much rather offload this solution space to somebody in our team who's a specialist in front-end design. Mm -hmm. right? So I would much rather our designer make this decision than me, the back-end engineer, let's say. Or if I'm coming in as a coach, I would much rather ask, well, who has the most to lose about us choosing the wrong theme or CSS framework? Like who will have the most work if we make the wrong decision? That person should then make the decision, or at least heavily weigh in on the decision. Like that, that, that's how I would approach sort of that yeah. that 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 solution space. There's mentioned, yeah, this is the way. First you hate it, then you may change your mind. It's safer in software. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Tony mentions, can you share his LinkedIn website? I believe you mean Pete, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Pete Heard. Uh, I'm just going to drop it in chat real quick. Do you have enough time, Adrian, to do the? Yeah, yeah. We have still two yeah. hours or something like that, right? 
<laughs> we have 25 minutes, give or take. I can do a quick pitch right now if you want. Uh, so this is his. This is his. Oh, I, I closed LinkedIn. Now oh, there we go. So I'm just gonna drop his LinkedIn. Uh, that's Pete Heard in chat. Yeah. All right. And thank you for asking, Tony. Okay. So. Should I put it on screen? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Actually, let's do a quick pitch. Uh, so, Adrian, you're doing CTO Fellowship and you're mentoring, you're coaching. Where mm -hmm. can we find you? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Slack up for CTO. Wait, do we, don't we have banners? Um... Not on this. Uh, we have banners, but I don't have your overlays from we, okay. we changed um, we changed StreamYards, so I didn't convert them over yet. Sorry. Okay. Um so uh as I wrote uh, posted already in my blog, so this is basically one of the central points next to LinkedIn, which is should mm -hmm. be quite easy to find um on LinkedIn, Adrian, my name and snack of a CTO. It's the cookie, all the posts with the cookies. And it's all mm -hmm. about mentoring. Um, so uh, mentoring CTOs, mentoring software developers, engineers, mentoring even entire teams, what we call mm -hmm. fellowship then, where we help teams to uh, fix their most most of the time cultural problems. Um, because it is, yeah, what, what we just see is most of the time not really technical problems, it's just a symptom of a more <clears throat> deep cultural problem. So we, mm -hmm. we basically our fellows for them. So we work over time here and there together with them, talking about things, helping things and thinking about things. So I'm, mm -hmm. I became a thinker. I'm not doing things fast anymore. I'm a slow typer now. Somehow I became slow, um, but I'm fast in the long run because I'm thinking about the right things, make the right decisions. And I tend to not make um, too many bad decisions anymore because I bled a lot because I'm entrepreneur type of person, which means that um, I'm CTO myself. I have my own employees for so many years and I wasted a lot of money, my own money. I basically made the wrong decisions. I wasn't thinking about those. And this is basically what I'm writing about. I'm writing about my failures um, to make it your success actually um so when i when i talk about things like today or last week or the weeks before or tomorrow with ryan finster um I, I talk about them in a way of 24 years of experience of making many mistakes probably i would have been if i would have done everything wrong i probably would have <coughs> been a millionaire which i'm not at the moment and this is one of those problems so we do a lot of prob um, mistakes and especially in software development everything we do is a decision it's a long-term decision. Mm -hmm. We don't realize it. Even the junior developers do long-term decisions for the team. No one is realizing that. So this is a little bit here, a little bit there, and somehow it become, it's, it's becoming costly to revert. I really mean costly to revert. It's not only time of the developers. So I, I saw companies laying off people because of that. So engineers were laid off and they were pissed off that. But in reality, it was basically, they, they let's say they added up to that point as well. So it was not only the employer, it was mm -hmm. only the company, it was on some degree, the team as well, because everyone is contributing to that to that point. And this is where I find myself quite well, is this cultural part of understanding yeah. tech, understanding tech lifecycle, understanding software engineering on a larger scale. Strategy, scope. you're very good exactly. at strategy. And this is, this is where I am heading. So I help teams to solve any form of problems they have. Um, of course, I have some specialities. I'm, I myself are a front end engineer. No, I was. I, I started. I can a, tell. A I can engineer. tell. I can tell. You know, like <laughs> the enthusiasm for this topic today. I can tell <laughs> that, I, that I there hate was SQL, that SQL, for example. So I know I understand <laughs> X, SQL, but I, I have a lot of internal resistance to use it. Um, so this is probably the reason why we went for RM systems, but this is another topic for another day. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, so it's it's my, my, my thing is more is I the majority of my time, I, I took the role of CTO, and thinking about things, thinking about strategies, mm -hmm. thinking about my own mistakes in the past, how to make it better, a lot of legacy migrations, a lot of modernizations, and that kind of stuff. So this is me, if you have something in that area, where where I can help you, feel free to just ask. So as you saw mm -hmm. today, we answering all questions you toss at us. Mm -hmm. So now I'm giving the word to you. 
Well, people think I'm a I'm a agile coach, but I'm actually a certified life coach and extreme programmer. So I, I sort of <laughs> did it the other way around. Um, Nowadays, I do two primary things. So I work with individuals, uh, especially team leads, tech leads, and solopreneurs in tech, sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and my second, my second focus, let's say my flagship product, is working long-term with an entire team, usually one-on-one -on -one life coaching with a leader, a specific leader, and their team directly. So rather than being a consultant and just giving you advice, I actually work with your team. Mm -hmm. I shadow them, I coach them, and I really help your team sort of uncover those recurring issues. Usually when your team is a cost center and they lose confidence and they become really slow and maybe even lethargic and they sort of don't write tests or don't know how to write tests or they tried and they failed and then they never tried again. And then none of the recurring issues really were ever addressed. We have cash flow problems and then, you, you know, quality suffers. and. I sort of come in to help you sort of untangle that. You might have nine different problems and you, you're you making small steps um, on all nine and then nothing really gets ever finished. So I come in and help you focus. No, okay, this one thing, we will agree on what that one thing is to make progress on. And then I, I help the leader to set incentives. I help the team to understand the tactics of it. And then... Fill in the gaps with whatever is needed, whether that's process change, whether that's workshops, whether that's just overcoming resistance. Usually, usually a mix of these, a mix of two of these, to then get that one thing to a bite-sized measure, and then we incrementally make progress on that, so that you're actually done with something week to week, month to month, rather than us opening up, you know, a can of worms, and then nothing really changes over. Uh, mm -hmm over time. So those are my two flagship offerings. It's mostly oriented towards sort of the the middle of the vertical. So engineering managers, tech leads, VPs, um, technical program managers, other agile coaches or platform engineering leads, or I also heard the term enablement leads or DevOps leads being used, right? So to capture really this triangle of somebody who's operational, but also has leadership and um, human capacity problems like the soft skill problems that's what i'm about um so if you want to reach out to me my linkedin is my best target for just to get in touch with me because we will have to build a relationship for the long-term stuff uh one-on-one -on -one, you can find me on mentor cruise and um i also run a few communities so crafting tech teams is my my newsletter that i sort of brain dump and sort of try to inspire you with uh, interesting tech news and uh, I also recently started sort of investing more time with our book club. And right now we're, we're reading Tidy First from Kent Beck. And our next book will be Planning Extreme Programming. And Kent Beck is actually joining us for the book club session next Thursday. Uh, so book club members have like a VIP spot. It's free for now. Wait, when you say uh, joining our stream? I mean, we have the book club after the stream. So maybe we can just, you know, continue. With... <laughs> Pull him. Don't let him go, you know? Yeah, I, I am trying to get Kent back on stream as well. But right now, he, he we got we, we found a very enthusiastic match for the book club. He is from San Francisco, though, so it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a time zone issue. Um, also, my kids are and we're getting kids our kids ready for kindergarten, so we <laughs> can't work as late as anymore as I used to. Uh, so there's that. And if you want, if you're ever ever curious about any of the links that we just mentioned. We are consolidating at least these streams on YouTube on uh, at our tech journey, and we're also doing that now on Twitch. So YouTube has, I'm making sure that YouTube has our up-to-date links for each of us. And once you get to our LinkedIn pages or our Substack pages, you can then find each other because we cross-link quite often. Um, yeah. yeah. No, let's go. Let's go. Yes. I respect yes. that. No, really, I respect that. I respect that. that. I, I, I respect that. that. Yeah, yeah, let, yeah. Let's, let's respect that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Wait, so what, what, do you what, want what to open the ID or shall I do? I, I'll, I'll do it. Because you told okay. me to. I got ready. Yeah, I told you I won't have time to get ready. Mm, let's, let's go. Now I got ready. So no, now sure. I want to bloody use it so that we can. So you, you gave me some, I don't know, Bitcoin miner. It's been lagging my CPU since I installed it. It's running. What are we doing? 
But, but now I have access to all your credit cards, and that was my goal. <laughs> finally, I make some money with it. You can finally do my taxes. You always wanted to do my taxes, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have an uh, IDE open, which is great. What, what do we see here? So I prepared a little boilerplate. This boilerplate is now for us, um, for the future streams as well. We'll be talking about things. This is Next.js 14 with React 18. We have Tenstack Query inside it. We have Tailwind. We have SCSS inside it. Uh, we have Next PWA currently inside it to make it a PWA, which will be interesting for the next week. Um, we have recall as state management. So um, this is what we will go. On. So um, we will try to be a little bit more hands on in the next time. So I don't want to to get away from this track. So we will stay with this. And this will be a GitHub repository. It's, actually, it is right now. We will we will send a link after the show. So you can take a look at it um, and how it progresses as well and even make contributions if you like so. Okay. Good. So from what I understood, you are now today showcasing a boots a a, a um, starter template that we will be continuing to use on our more front-end oriented examples on stream and this is our let's say first first contact with it so when i load this up in the browser yeah. it's a blank white page with the title index um yeah what so go, go into readme file today? yeah uh, go into readme file which one Shift 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 read me. I don't I don't I don't use those hotkeys. But I think you meant this one, right? The client file? Yeah, exactly. And uh okay. there just take the first link. Okay. No, I don't I don't I'm not sharing the browser, unfortunately. But I will open it. Okay. And okay. it's a blank. And this is just the outcome. This is it is it is very simple. So the idea was to have a, a, a small list today. We'll be going through. So having mm -hmm. a a list with a headline above it, a wrap mm -hmm. around it, and two different types of list items. That was my actual idea. Um, it was for mm -hmm. online bookings and for on-site bookings. The content is, does it really matter? It's just about um, seeing how Tailwind works and how okay. CSS will. So the same inter implementation in the same environment next to each other, and that we can all look mm -hmm. what we mean with uh, going into smaller components um, and uh, having those things and maybe doing some refactorings on the go. That was actually the idea. And I would say we just start with it, take a look how it takes, how it long. Yeah, you know, let's, you know? let's do the Tailwind one because I don't use Tailwind mm -hmm. often. So if you can, if I can learn something real quick, I think somebody in the audience might be able to learn something. So how do we go yeah, about this? So you go into pages. So it's, um, when you know, so for the audio audience, if you know Next.js, this is the little bit older version of the router, the page router, not the app router yet. So because, okay. because it's a basically a modernized uh, boilerplate and this part isn't modernized yet. Um, okay. Go into the CSS demo, which represents the, the current file, which is Tailwind demo. And this is okay. actually a file to go. Exactly. So I would do it a little bit so um, lower font size is better in Tailwind. So maybe no, I will, I will turn some. on Word Rep. Yeah. I will turn on Word Rep. Oh, good, good. No, because it has good, to good. be. I will turn on folding. No, I don't. I can't. See, I think. I think this is what the contrarians mean. This is what they hate. Yeah. This is what they hate that I have to scroll this much. It is. It is. <laughs> um, so this is um, indeed one of those problems. So I don't know if you have pretty or linter at the moment, but this is not really important. What I would start now is um, really to go in. So we only need that file. So I would double tap on the file name. And then you have a little bit more space to work on because we don't need to switch mm -hmm. files now. This is one of okay. those good parts when you're working with that. So you're, you're working mm -hmm. that one right now. So it's quite large still, but it's okay. So what we should try to do is not getting any wider than what we see up there. So this is some kind of rule of thumb, I would say, okay. in my own project. This is already quite long. And if we have it longer, and what I wanted to have is actually this is this is I would just wanted to give it away a little bit to just show how it would look like throughout. So what we have, for example, with the 500 pixels is basically a um, I forgot how they they called. Okay, 
write it in the comments if you if you remember how they were called. Um, those are basically literals. They are not part of the utility class, but you create your own custom utility class with minimum height of 500 pixels. So this is just for an, an exemplary thing at the this, moment. So we have the same class, version for a with class with a parameter. Exactly, a customized class. I forgot how. This was mm -hmm. uh, this was a big update back then. I remember we have mm -hmm. max w five xl for example. This is the same yeah. with width, um, which is basically a predefined version of it. I can't remember to be honest which, which what 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 exactly pixel size that is. But that is actually the the utility class you get mm -hmm. from your, from mm -hmm. Tailwind, and the other is some something we defined for that specific purpose in that Fair. moment instead of using the style tag. Uh, style attribute. Okay. So this now, is instead I don't of know using if that, you can, you can see this. I don't know if you can see this, but when I hover over the class, we at can't. least um, WebStorm for me picks up that this is Tailwind and actually gives me a a mm -hmm. tooltip that tells me what CSS this will end up including in the compiled CSS. So that's something yeah. I'm I'm commenting on because you can't see it. Um, so what did you want to build here? Where do you want to take this? So I would say we start with a markup. So um, this is uh, for everyone. We have no tests inside. We have no specifications. It's just for showcasing Tailwind right now. So mm -hmm. I would say we create some kind of little component. Um, it, I would say we, we create a little section where we have a headline and we have a unordered list and several list items, either with a class or the idea of being an online item and a on-site item with just a little bit of text unordered? inside that. So let, let's start with unordered. the list. Unordered yeah. list. Do you want the section outside? Do you want we some kind of that, section? Yes. Yeah, okay. this is a section of its own. So, so I okay. think it's uh, um, exactly. And what did you want? What did you want for the for the loop? Um, how did you want to style the loops? Um, the idea was to have two. Let's say I, I would I would go with, uh, for example, a um, let's let's. The idea is to be different. So um, it is easy to have just one class and say, um, you know, every item is the same, but you have, if you have mm -hmm. different items, like originally it was the idea of having the noti notifications tab, where mm -hmm. sometimes in notifications you have buttons, sometimes it's just information, sometimes mm -hmm. it's an aggregate of things. And um, this is the idea to have um, different, uh, let's say, list items inside there. Um, display just for for the purpose of seeing how we need to com uh, okay. componentize. Uh, what the, what's say. the domain here? Like, well, what are we building in the components? Well, which is the page is called Tailwind Demo, but what what are we really? What, let, let, what then, let, we... let's 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 call it a notifications tab. So we just have a notifications tab. Let, let's agree okay. on this. You are right. That wasn't well well prepared. To be honest, it was very hasty. Okay, but so let's, um, let, this... let's create a notification okay. tab. A notification tab. Uh, let's just call it like this. Notifications usually don't say that they're notifications. Uh, we have two new messages. Mm -hmm. Adrian. Uh, uh, so maybe only two. I think they are enough. Maybe we just need to make a difference. Uh, that that's good. Maybe maybe you leave that in for the entire show. And maybe we we add now a little link or a button into the into the um in, into one of those, but okay. not in the others. It's one of those, but into uh, the others. Exactly. How do you want it the button? Link as well. Semantically. Make, make okay, it maybe an, uh, maybe make an anchor maybe just yeah. Okay. Uh, and what do you want here just on the just, side? Um, this is just I would say link to my blog. <laughs> the... <laughs> That's nice. That's uh, <laughs> intrusive, uh, but <laughs> uh, funny. Okay. Um, Actually, that's not not really the emphasis. So no, it's, um, if it's you, not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's a bit. Uh, I think you need to uh, need to activate prettier in your settings because I think I that should, should yeah. not look like this. Yeah. On that's some point, it becomes good. really ugly. Yes. Uh, what went wrong here? 
Uh, I didn't turn on Prettier, and it is also uh, the AI element. No, it actually it is it is turned on, and it's um, it was uh, for me in WebStorm. Me. I need to activate that per project project somehow. Yeah, I don't too. know why yeah. that is. It's I, just in the I settings just set up this project automatic. ten seconds before we started the stream, so I'm and not sure I have it. Uh, okay, so uh, we have that. Maybe in head, it would be nice in this in the section to have a headline like notifications. Maybe make it mm -hmm. to a, I don't know. A, well, what tag would you like me to use for the headline? Oh, H, H2 or H3, something like that. Okay. It's not a page headline, but um, exactly. Yeah, because people the, have different opinions about what H2 I know. and H1 mean. So. I know. So, yeah, I would go with that. So um, in the audience, if, if there are people smarter than us, Please tell us which tech we should use for that kind of thing. It's a label, it's a headline, a diff element. No, it's not a diff element. It will never be a diff element. But okay. Um, and Don't the idea is headers. to maybe style that first. And then because there is something, it's a Tailwind specific, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to headlines is you don't want to repeat those classes over and over again. So let's do mm -hmm. it straightforward. Make this class text black font xl with a text color of primary which is I okay don't know now you gotta you gotta be out. a little bit more you gotta help me out here because i don't i don't know okay. where the class that name first of all class name mm -hmm. first of oh, all oh sorry yeah i'm exactly then you just text dash xl mm -hmm. font dash black uh text dash primary now, and track, did you memorize these? Dash, yeah, yeah. Did you memorize these? Is this part of Tailwind default, or yeah, are this is the, we... uh, this is this is what I what do I what I said about the upper, uh, the upper ceiling of complexity, which is not that high. Um, mm -hmm. And you you what we learn when we use that type of, of of utility classes, we know what we use as a team most often, and those we memorize. There are some things you don't memorize that good, but I think okay. I've memorized quite a lot of those things already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for example, so the, tracking. So, the, so this is where the. Uh, so yeah, go 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 ahead. Could you repeat, please? The tracking dash tight should look Tanti a little bit like that. Tight. Okay. Tight. So it's yeah. um, so. This is a very basic idea of a headline. The problem it's, is already. I, I have this it takes... open in my browser. It's pretty. It's pretty. But 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 I'm getting a bit uneasy because we keep going to the right, you know. Being exactly a more so so and this is the point. Now, if if we now would repeat that exact type of of elements somewhere else, we would have a problem. So this. Of course, could just copy that. But then yeah, we so had if that I in, do the, this, in the comments as well. So the the problem we're talking about, if we had this, mm -hmm. then this repetition is annoying, yeah. and it is the main thing contrarians mm -hmm. criticize Tailwind for. Yeah. And I believe you and have a solution to this problem that we can, imp that we can two, implement. Uh, in actually, two, two solutions. So we had that in the in the audience, um, the, the question how we can solve this. The first one is what I what I used back then is to create a class, CSS class somewhere else, for example, you know, just okay. a, in a where? CSS module. For where? Um, this is the problem. And this is then a global form. So you need to have okay. that. Um, um, somewhere in this is this is a more let's say traditional old school approach where you have this global CSS file and I will put CSS it here. in this case, and you probably you will import it in some form of external yeah. file. Yeah. So you have some form of, but okay. you could write it down here for the sake of time uh, okay. to just write it inside here. Is that um, your preferred approach? No. No. What What, what is like your preferred approach? approach? Preferred approach is to now create. A, let's Let's open the tree. The, 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 uh -huh. the tree for the component tree. Let's go into source components. Uh huh. Create a um, yeah. I don't call don't like it to call it atoms. So I have uh, let, let's just do it like create a folder called typo is already there. <laughs> I, I think I prepared that already. Uh, go okay. for typo and go headline. Okay, a little bit of time saving here. So I started okay. to create a new um, uh, to new, a new component, uh, which is mm -hmm. at the moment for you to create. So it's just a a, a boilerplate for it for a react component, which mm -hmm. is typed, which is headline, which does only have at the moment the property of children. Uh, 
which means mm -hmm. that you need to put inside children and you need to recreate what you just created inside that component where you now go to tailwind demo again you take the h2 tag entirely entirely and i you rip it out with exactly the, with the header with the headline headline oh sorry headline yeah yeah and i believe what goes in is the text notifications yeah. Yeah. yeah so let me hang on let me let me hold on to that and uh, notifications yeah so we had notifications and i'll import exactly. it here mm -hmm. uh actually it can't find it for me right now i believe that will it will find it later when i headline header liner or header line uh, oh sorry, sorry. headline okay. thank you and okay um... it found it it will now yes import okay sorry you, you can't exactly. see the tooltip um yeah. And I'm not I'm, I'm not happy how prettier it's configured, but <laughs> a problem for another time. It, it is it so is not you... yet it this is not the prettier configuration, definitely. It's not working at the moment. So this what is... do you want me to do with the React component first? So, so what you do you can want me just to keep uh, the erase fragment? the return. Yeah, yeah. Replace the fragment because the linter rules forbid to have unnecessary fragments. To have empty, yeah, I, I, I figured that was the problem. Because it can cause problems and re-renderings in some situations. Mm -hmm. And that was another story. So what you have now is a simple abstracted version of a headline. And you can do that with all sorts of things. You just need to implement, or uh, sorry, implement. Mm -hmm. You just need to put in children, children right in now. Here, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And, um, how do you prefer to style this? It? Is the linter correct? Is or is it should or should it be like this? Because I see yeah. the linter is not correcting me. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, now it's, I am getting it's not at, at this, yeah. yeah, at this font size, I am uneasy with you know this sort of right scrolling. But um, what do we do? So now this is the solution to it, right? So now mm -hmm. I am creating a markup that carries the mm -hmm. CSS. Yeah. Uh, but what if I wanted to reuse this for an H3? How deep does this rabbit hole go? Ah, okay. Okay. Um, so let's say we could uh, a simple approach. We have we could create an enum or just a union type in mm -hmm. a new property okay. called size or tech or something like that, and we okay. allow H2, a H3. Property or just a constant. You can just... Like, like, do I want it a to property, be reusable outside of this? Okay. Yeah, this is a property. You want to define that and have a default um, in that case. So this is how I do that. So maybe we just you start wouldn't... create a new. Uh... I don't think I don't think we'll have enough time for that. I think I think we should probably wrap up. Mm. Uh, what is the example that you really wanted to highlight here? So now that now that I've created this, I now have a. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's a component, but it's just a. A HTML, a, a markup fragment that I just happen to use React for. I wouldn't have to use React for this, right? No. I didn't use anything React. Yeah, right, right. And, yeah, of course. Like it, I, there was nothing React and Tailwind specific with this. It's just that React had a very easy document fragment system for me to then couple the markup with the CSS, so that I don't yeah. have to repeat the CSS. Um, is this exactly. is this is this what modern tailwind usage would look like or is this just an low hanging fruit is this like an easy win or is this like the main skill it's maybe that would a dominate? good question for the audience because i'm not everyone right um mm -hmm. so i only know the context i am working in and especially when it comes to react this is actually a viable way to structure your your components so mm -hmm. the benefit is we would we would if we would go on with that example, which was the intention, is that mm -hmm. we have in every listed element, which could be basically, it, it must not be a, a list, but it's, it's good for, for semantics to have that as mm -hmm. a list. Um, you know, every part of the list can be a different component, you know? Yeah. It can be an entirely different component with complexity in CSS isolated in that component in a I mean, reusable From what I'm looking way. at, th th this might be a for loop where I'm reading something from the back end and then the back end decide which component it is based on what's in the data fragment. Um, yeah. And, and the, the data good part fragment. and the good part is um, we only have, let's say one file per component. This is the component driven idea. And mm -hmm. um, especially now here, take a look at the UL and LI. If you wouldn't have opened the CSS file, you would have no clue what's going on. It's, it's mm -hmm. for you at the moment, just you only know what's the idea behind the markup. You don't know how mm -hmm. it look like you can't, uh, you can't even do, let's say, um, 
let's say any form of debugging regard inside the browser itself you need to open the second file and this is a quite simple thing but when it comes mm -hmm. larger and bigger you need to have and you have several components at the same time in the same file you need to mm -hmm. you have a lot of uh, let's say connections your your brain needs to compile and if you Wait, work with now, a team everyone needs to do that and this is one now of those points if i would points. take this div and call it a panel a white panel and open mm -hmm. and move this to a component and have this yeah. section and call it a notification section and move this to a component and the headline to a component and the list to a component and the list item to a component at what point does somebody slam the table and say, Dennis, this is too many goddamn one-liner components that we need 11 lines to write? Um, you know, it depends on what you want to build. If you want to build a website, you have less need of component-driven things. If you mm -hmm. build complex web apps, you you will you will end up in, in component. As, otherwise, you will end up in like a tightly for, for coupled now, mess. For now, we don't have any right? behavior. We don't have any state. We don't have any effects. We don't have any memorization. We don't have any aggregate functions. We don't have any complex mm -hmm. data flows. Right now, we're just exactly. doing this for markup. Would you do this just for, for the sake of... It, it sounds like we are doing no, a lot for, of um, markup shenanigans just to, just to have a leash on Tailwind's um, code bloat. Is that an unfair? I, I don't try. I don't try to get even if it sounds like I don't try to convince someone to use it. I talked mm -hmm. about my own experience, why I chose to use it on strategic layer, tactical layer mm -hmm. and operational layer and all those. Mm -hmm. And I asked, uh, I, I answered those questions. Um, who was it harming? No one who mm -hmm. who didn't like it mm -hmm. no one and uh, basically did i have any problems with maintainability no and those are just mm -hmm. real things we have over i think it was 21 apps running with that setup and we have mm -hmm. no problem since yes because of that and everyone is happy no one is complaining mm -hmm. we have no single developer who said oh it wasn't a good idea to use tailwind mm -hmm. and of course people are influenced by what you say what you implement what you do as a team mm -hmm. of course it's always like if you post something about tailwind most people say it's great if you t post something against tailwind most people will say you know it's people gathering around things it's I, I understand that and i don't try to convince people using it i try to explain why i uh, used it and why it's in, it, why eventually it become our go-to um, set up to use and why it's good. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't replicate it with CSS. By no means this uh, this is the case because we the, the other part is we have a lot of legacy applications we are responsible still mm -hmm. for which which are using as CSS and yes. uh, or CSS and um, we we using them as well. It's 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 possible to work with them as well. It's not like uh, so it's not like. Hey, it, it's it's uh, bad or something like that. It's it's simple. We are we are slower with working mm -hmm. with just CSS because it doesn't help us. It's it's a little bit like working with plain JavaScript and TypeScript. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things we, where TypeScript really helps you getting auto completion interfaces types enums without knowing, Absolutely. especially when like, you import packages. If anything, this is the same I like with that Taylor. I can. If anything, I like that I can use TypeScript with CSS. Like to me, TypeScript is by far the best. Like any kind of anything in the JavaScript ecosystem is a much more easier to use modularization tool than mm. SCSS, for example, or any kind of XCSS component. Like not not even component framework, just a build tool. Because I'm getting flashbacks from Guzzle and Grunt and all of those really old school and very clumsy to use build systems because they are declaratively compiled and then. You can't really have dynamic properties in them. So I, as a, let's say, newbie Tailwind, you know, Mateusz says, yep, that's why I don't see any added from value from Tailwind. So I think that's on my comment from just using the React fragments, not even full components that with the life cycle, just fragments to hide Tailwind uh, sugar. Uh, and he says, based on that example, if you just use BEM, uh, it, it makes sense if you're creating React-based design systems, so you can reuse components among multiple applications. Um, now, I see an immediate benefit here in that I didn't have to touch. Uh, wait, where was the where was the CSS file? Where's the here it is? Styles. I didn't have yeah. to touch this. I, I'm really happy with that, right? So, if I change 
the styles of my component, in this case, my headline. I know that text XL will create a text XL class. Font black will create a font black class. Text primary will create a text primary class. And only the classes that I used will go into the CSS file that will be bundled with this page as it gets routed to on the user's web page. I didn't have to open up two files and say, I'm now using this style. I need to add this style in the CSS file and I need to add the usage of the CSS, the, the, the style itself in the HTML or the JSX or the component or the JavaScript, whatever, right? So I already benefit from this. I see the sort of ease of use, even for a simple use case. What I'm a bit hesitant is that I'm wondering at what point where it makes more sense to just handcraft these classes and say, you know what, I'm just going to take this and I'm just going to call it, right, headline style. And this is what I, what I mentioned as aggregates beforehand, what you do. It is like yeah. um, you, 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 this is, let's say, the beauty of ugly. Um, how, how many the beauty of ugly. <laughs> um, it, is, it is like, I, it is, it is it, at first you think, what, what, what crap is this? Framework you know? is forcing me to go right on the editor. Yeah. So, so I would it like is to like, this. first of all, first of all, let's think a little bit about what we're doing here. And this is oftentimes a problem for, let's say, especially developers who are not in the mindset of an engineer. Um, and especially front-end people who often derive from the web design area. So mm -hmm, we try mm -hmm. to have a lot of, let's say, emphasis on specific patterns, um, on, on how CSS is working, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. the idea is, what, what, what you say, you, you mentioned so often this horizontal problem, you know, going mm -hmm. to the right in that case. Yeah. But this is not actually a bad thing. It keeps you from putting in stuff you don't need. And this is what I said in the beginning, uh, when, when you compare that. And, and we had that, you know, the projects we had in the past have literally, uh, we had, we had that, we had a measurement tool for that in the past. We had mm -hmm. literally enormous files after three years using CSS and we had mm -hmm. much less delivered code with um, mm -hmm. Tailwind because we only use what really was necessary because it hurts us. It literally mm -hmm. hurts us our eyes, our feelings, everything. It is <laughs> ugly. I don't say it's nice. Yeah, no, it's not yeah. nice, but it, it is a hell. It's a, but it, so but it, if, but it, but it, it's the it, least offensive of all the alternatives. It is. Is that so that's what you're saying? Uh, the aggregation you mean? What do I say? Yes. Yes. And just keeping yeah, it yeah, in yeah. line and just, it just keeping it, keeping it in, in the devil, you know, and yeah. optimizing readability here at the benefit of keeping the vertical size of this thing you know because because when i moved out it to a const the line the file immediately gained two more lines and then i didn't really benefit anything from that it's not really dynamic i'm never going to reuse this fragment with any other kind of styling right now so this idea that i'm that i'm sort of becoming this sort of hyper generic coder that's mm -hmm. a trap for a beginner let's say that this doesn't have to be generic this has to be this exactly this until we have a better use case for this. And even if I have a second H2 with a different class, I even even have to decide, is this still a headline? Or maybe I just didn't name this properly. Maybe this is a notification headline, not a headline. And it should never be generic. It should never be yeah, simplified true. down true. to a, right? So this is one of the ideas of, of the um, definitions of custom elements and web components. Yeah. You need to have a specific, you need to have a, some kind of, I don't know, I wasn't remember, but I think it was some type of prefix or the dash you need to have, and then you know, okay, it's it's part of that yeah. one, a yeah. namespace. Yeah. And yeah. Um, this, I really like that. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say right now is, I forgot again, tired already. Whatever um, you did want to say, it has to be your last thought for today, because we should be wrapping up. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> I, <told you>. um, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, so, yeah, wrapping up, wrapping up the entire topic. So, um, when, when we think about using, let's say, or thinking about our tech stack. So, uh, when when we when we have an idea like you have open right now, you have mm -hmm. this code base level. You have the tactical level where things like how do you, let's say, be able to to deploy that stuff. Um, 
how can you how can you maintain code quality like how mm -hmm. can you make sure that you don't couple your code too much all those kind of things there mm -hmm. are so many things you need to talk about and of course yeah. how fast you can hire people developer on a strategic level how can mm -hmm. you extend your team over time so this is the entire vertical you need to think about those things and you can't just judge tailwind bootstrap material ui or SCSS just on the operational layer. And this is what I see on LinkedIn. And this is the reason why we have the stream today. The stream is all about shedding some light on the entire vertical. And it's not only about, oh, it's ugly. So, and this is the reason why many people say the beauty of ugly. And the beauty of ugly means that in this ugliness, in the end, something more beautiful than the traditional approach can, can come out of that. It is, you can't find it out by just take a look at the examples you find the examples because people come the examples up with those are silly because them. they solve a non-existing problem and then you when, only see the ugly who when you have for a single diff element for a single diff element okay when you have let's say 30 or 40 classes or even more what's mm -hmm. wrong what's wrong with your code what's wrong with your skill set this is this is even even in in css thinking it's too much because mm -hmm. that means that on this single element there is so much which influences the elements below yes i know that was the original idea of cascading you know c in the ss um but the the problem is we are in component driven designs we're creating web apps so this isn't meant to be like that anymore and this is one of those things which people you know people are pissed off because of right that because tailwind and other or let's say atomic css style utility class frameworks are going a path which wasn't intended to be like that in the very beginning maybe in the very very beginning when we had styles and then we moved to classes and now we somehow uh, like we are a little bit retro this is why for example rich uh, richard is saying that richard smith is saying in the comments already that for him it's nothing else than styles so the original so maybe the overarching idea yes but the implementation no it's it's, it's still different and the thing is we need to th rethink how we work with front end. And we need to rethink and we need to think about if this benefits us. So for example, Mateus, who is now saying that um, you can basically do that by just using BEM. Yeah, you can. The the thing is you need to decide before you do that if this is actually a good thing or it's not a good thing. So it's about decision making. It's not about influencing others that it, that, that everyone should use Tailwind now. It's about making the right decision for your context for your needs, for your strategic needs. So it is it is very easy today to find people, junior developers who already can do the very basics with Tailwind. It is very hard to find a to find junior developers who are able to work in your legacy application, which is made with CSS. This is just my plain experience. This is horrible to find people for that. It is hard to maintain a development life cycle like that. And development life cycle is not only about the code base, it's about the people working that, you know, and it's not about, yeah, then just learn your craft. It is not that easy. It's not only about learning craft. There's, there's Marcel, for example, in the comments quite often. He's a very experienced person. We found out that we started in, a, started in another domain with, on, the, on the same machines 20 years ago. And he developed an entire, entirely different opinion than I did. So you can't just say, okay, we create a new team, we pull off both together, we have quite a similar experience, and you find out you have two totally different people there. It is not about just, it is not just a simple one to, you know, zero to hundred percent skill set. It is not about that. It's so complicated to assemble teams, to get the culture right. And the more things you implement, which helps you, how literally helps you giving a frame, giving a baseline will help you mitigate most of the problems you have already. For example, I I I help it. I, I would prefer I would prefer if we didn't open up the example because I do have to jump off because we're done when it's over. And, uh, and <laughs> okay, we, we did we did have a comment from Istvan. Uh, Istvan's comment didn't make it through because he edited the comment, uh, oh, but he did okay. mention that um, when the components get specific to the mm -hmm. I, I believe the JavaScript tooling of the project. The fragment, the HTML, gets hard to reuse because it's coupled to the to the to the ecosystem of the, the JavaScript ecosystem, the backend ecosystem, or the, the middleware ecosystem. I think that's what I extracted from his comment. He says, 
an issue I see that an example is that you can quick, cannot quickly reuse the component in different projects. One project may need 10x, 10px padding, the other may need 15px. Then you need to update P10 to P15 at many places. If you're using something like SCSS with Bootstrap, then you just update an SCSS variable to tweak the padding. Again, this that's idea of true. It is, that's, is it a component thing, is it a global yeah. style thing? I think this merits follow up in some kind of article or maybe a comment because mm -hmm. I, 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 it does seem like a little bit of a over generalization of a, like a very trivial example that I think has a very simple. This is just about there. configuration. So you have a configuration, configuration. Of a project. And if you know that, this is the reason why I say you need to understand Tailwind, the idea, the idea mm -hmm. behind it, the design system. And then you know that a padding of two Two, so let's say p dash two means that mm -hmm. in my project and that in my project. So um, if I if this is the padding from a card to the content, which is basically the simple Fair. idea of padding, so it's I the know second that it can level be of the padding, it, not right. exactly not ten px. So not if I tend PX, to create two over-engineered right. designs which are pixel mm -hmm. perfect to perfect a degree, perfect. and this is what I meant at the beginning, mm -hmm. then you end up having this problem. This is not the mm -hmm. problem of tearing CSS or something. This is a problem with your requirements. This because is a requirement your, problem. Because, because you think that the engineering, the engineering problem is that I end up writing the same markup, but the two projects that Istvan mentions didn't have the same design system. So it shouldn't be reusable. I mean, if you think about it that way, if if the if the style and the markup belong together, then it shouldn't be reusable if the design system is different, right? So, I think something has to give. I think I'm not, that that's sort of my naive, more philosophical take on it. But I do have to jump off. If you want to yeah. continue the stream, I'm super happy with that. Uh, but I do need to prepare the kids, the kiddos. Uh, actually, for actually, I have I have to do some work today, so. Um... <laughs> It does make sense uh, to keep it with those two hours. We sometimes a little bit over. We um, went a little bit over today, to, yes. Uh, yeah. um, so uh, next week is PWA. Maybe we have a little wrap up and there will definitely be a follow up thing about Tailwind. Yeah. Maybe I do some tomorrow, videos instead. Tomorrow we have Brian Finster and we are yeah. talking about the hard problems that engineers are facing. So basically how to how to own your engineering outcomes in the context of what craftsmanship skills can help you navigate which hard problems in tech and what are really the hard problems in tech and how mm -hmm. you can gain opportunities to actually grow as an engineer rather than just you know follow requirements and we are happy to receive place. feedback as well which means that um, we're talking you know two and a half hours nearly about a topic and um, <clears throat> we are always happy if this is helping you and if you like us to do things things differently or have any form of feedback it is always good <laughs> to have because of course we we have opinions, we have our own style, how we're doing things. And I think that's good, but it's often interesting. You know, we had now accumulated, I don't know, two to 400 people during the stream. Most of them were yeah. shadow your audience users. And yes. the interesting part on, on all four platforms together over the two hours. And now we don't only know from some comments what's actually going on in your head. And even though it doesn't really help us, you know, knowing exactly what you need. For example, Mateusz, uh, Max, you, you mentioned a lot, Grant mentioned something. Feel free to toss us some DMs afterwards. We're always happy about yep. that. What do you Super. think about the type of shows we do? Because the different mm -hmm. from time to time, uh, do, shall we do more code? Ha would it be more interesting to start with a code editor in the, in the first 10 minutes already and then just go, you know, <laughs> From scare everybody out of, <laughs> and all this kind of thing. Just give us some feedback. We want to learn. We are here to learn yeah. as well. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Adrian, especially for preparing the example and because it's it's a really uh, good example. I just installed it. I had boom, boom, boom. I, had, I was ready. Uh, that makes me happy. As an engineer, I appreciate the developer experience of your prepared example. So thank you so much. And if you're, if you're interested in a little bit more about the hands-on stuff, maybe we can either make a mini session in between or exactly about that, or yep. we go into some kind of video format exactly about that. Feel free yep. to comment, tell us about that, what you think yep. is a good idea. We're very DM friendly. Subscribe, follow, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow with our show okay. with on our show with Brian Finster. Thank, Thank you. Thank so you everyone. Thank you so much. Have and a good see one. you tomorrow then. See you tomorrow. Bye. I'm just gonna put on some lovely music for you to some ducks and uh,